John chapter 8, verses 2 to 11. At dawn he appeared again in the temple courts, where all the people gathered around him and sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let any of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left, with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. At our church, we've just started a new teaching series. If you were here last week, you would have heard the first part of it. We're moving through a section of the Gospel of John, one of the books written about Jesus in the New Testament. And we're beginning at a section where we stopped a couple of years ago, chapter 6, and we're moving through the middle section of that gospel. Uh, last week we thought about Jesus as the bread of life and uh, today we're going to look at this account. On the second Sunday uh, at MOBC of the, of the month we do the service a little differently. Um, so I'm going to preach the first part of the message now and uh, then we take a break halfway through the sermon. We sing a song, try to get uh, the meaning uh, deep within us and then we we crack into the rest of the message uh, at that point, and then we continue in prayers and other parts of the service. So I'm going to pray, then I'll start uh, the message on this passage. Our Father, we thank you for Jesus. Help us to see something more of him and his life-changing power right now. Amen. Well... I've been reading a good book the last couple of weeks. There's a picture of it on the screen, uh, and I have it here in my hand, by a lady named Lisa uh, Turkhurst. Good boundaries and goodbyes. Good boundaries and goodbyes. Very good book. Uh, it is mostly about a very serious issue. Uh, good thing for pastors to read about, but, but all people, I guess. Um, how to deal with and help people um, who are in a relationship that has become truly toxic and dangerous. Uh, you know, a terrible marriage, but also other relationships uh, that are toxic and dangerous. But the book is also just generally dealing with an issue all of us struggle with all the time. Where is the line between uh, law and mercy? Uh, protection, protecting others, protecting ourselves, and forgiveness of someone who's done the wrong thing. Uh, it can be agonizing for parents to figure this out just with their own children or their little children. Well, they're older children. Without discipline or punishment, and my kids are going to become monsters. Every parent knows that. That's because of our human nature. But my children have to know that I accept them completely. <laughs> How do those two things go together? With friends or with colleagues, something goes wrong. You know, when should I be gentle? When should I be firm? Sometimes when you're in a situation like this, you feel trapped. Either option could end, end badly. You know, my, my graciousness could be abused. You know? But if I'm, if I'm harsh, the relationship is ruined. If you've ever struggled to forgive someone, you know the feeling. I, I feel trapped. I can't win either way. What am I going to do? We feel this in ourselves when we look within. If I'm making excuses for myself, my bad behaviour, I know that's not right. That's no way to live. 
I'm too easy on myself. But on the other hand, if I have a, a really self-condemning, crushing criticism of myself, that's not living either. Now, wouldn't the world be good if we could get all of that just right somehow? Well, the same trap was set for Jesus in the account we just read. Uh, it's a gut-wrenching drama. Of course, it's a life and death moment for the woman who was brought before Jesus. She could be publicly executed. And we'll get to that in a moment. But the first thing to see is that it is a trap for Jesus in his life and ministry. His enemies seek to put him into a situation in which there's a no-win situation for him. And it is a genuine problem, as I say, for society, for every relationship. Do I insist on morality or do I insist on mercy, justice or compassion? So let's just enter the story uh, first because it's a pretty good one. Uh, we'll dive into the drama and then a little later we'll come back out of it and we'll see if it can make a difference to our lives. But it's good first just to observe how Jesus is. Uh, to observe his character and wisdom and spend enough time just for a minute to see if we can absorb his character and his wisdom in this episode. And what did you see in him? when Rowan was reading it for us. I saw a lot. I see his calm confidence. It's an angry, violent, terrifying moment. I don't know if you've ever been in a violent situation or in a situation in which you felt it, it could become violent at any moment. The temperature was going up. Something felt like it was going to explode. Um, it's a ter terrifying thing. And I suspect the people in the crowd just looking on at what's just happened. The woman is dragged before Jesus. Well, what am I about to witness? What is going to happen? And remarkably, Jesus just slows everything down to begin with. And he writes, or it might just say literally that he, he just scribbles in the dirt. <laughs> As if he wants to take his own time to respond. And when he asks them his question, right, he, he, goes, he goes back to writing. As if to say, and why don't you take your time to really think about what's happening there is no panic in Jesus. Think about that. And I see a man not in any way controlled by other people's demands. <laughs> and that must be because he has no fear. He must know who he is so deeply that he has no fear of rejection. So others cannot exercise control over him with their demands. And because he doesn't live his life feeding his pride, he doesn't just treat the woman with dignity, he even treats the accusers with dignity. He's gentle with her, and on this occasion, he's even gentle with them. We'll see in a moment that Jesus was in a position in which he could have flat out accused them of a miscarriage of justice, a serious miscarriage of justice in the law of Moses. But instead, he says something like, <laughs> why don't you just ask your own heart what's in it? Some of us enjoy confrontation because we like to put others down. That's our pride. Some of us will avoid confrontation at all costs. We hate it. 
because we want other people to like us. That's our pride. So whether we enjoy confrontation or we avoid it at all costs, for most of it's because we're proud. Jesus' humility is clear because he does not enjoy confrontation, but he never avoids it. He's thinking about what's best for the woman and the accusers and all the people watching without fear. It stuns me how he is. I can't speak for you, but it draws me into him like no one else. And then, of course, there's just his cleverness. Uh, And he is clever. I mean, the trap is a good one. Uh, They're clever, these Pharisees. His enemies know that if he says the woman should be killed, that the law should be honoured, well, that's damaging for Jesus. His reputation as the man of mercy, the man of grace, is destroyed. And it's his mercy and his grace that draw all the people to him all the time. The other thing that happens if he says, yes, stone her, she deserves it, is that they can report him to the Roman authorities. As it says elsewhere in the Gospel, the Jewish people at this time did not have the authority to execute people. Uh, They needed permission of the Romans, who were their overlords. If somebody were to sanction or to conduct uh, a public execution, then Pontius Pilate would come down on them like a ton of bricks. But if Jesus says she should be let go, doesn't matter what she did, well, he's saying the law of Moses doesn't matter. Do whatever you want. What kind of rabbi would say that? So Jesus is either seen to be sticking up for morality and crushing the person, or sticking up for the person and crushing morality. Can't win. How can he get out of it? Well, he does. Jesus knows the law of Moses. And Moses' law in various places in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy chapter 13, 17, 19, 22, Leviticus chapter 24, talks about scenarios like this and this um, particular scenario as well, adultery and execution in the life of Israel. And the law of Moses uh, says the punishment is incredibly strict and harsh, but so is the burden of proof in the Jewish law. In fact, the burden of proof is extremely high. There must be at least two witnesses to adultery. You have to actually uh, see the act happening. That's what it says in those passages. You you can't just see people disappearing behind a door or something like that. The witnesses must must visualise the act of adultery. This would be extremely rare. I mean, it's a pretty private sin. So the Finding the proof is incredibly difficult. The burden of proof is incredibly difficult. There must be two witnesses. Um, One of the witnesses cannot be the husband or the wife, two independent people, and both the man and the woman in the law of Moses face equal punishment. That is clear. All these rules were to protect people from being set up, to protect people from favouritism, so that you know, only the man or only the woman was brought to trial, and so that the charges could not be brought out of revenge you know, because you were angry at somebody. That's what the law says. For this trial to be righteous, for this trial to be without sin, the accusers need to be sinless in these matters. They don't need to be sinless in their whole life but righteous in the way that they have accused somebody. Now, John states that she was caught in the act of adultery. The Pharisees have accused her of this, but in the verses previously, John, the narrator, he says she was caught in the act of adultery. And at the end of the account, Jesus refers to her sin. So it seems pretty clear that, amazingly, 
as it sounds, she was caught in the act of adultery. But that also means that it's clear that the accusers have sinned against the law by not bringing two people to trial. And Jesus seems to be saying, if you have not sinned in this matter, you accusers, throw the stone. Anybody looking on and who has any idea of the law of Moses knows that this so-called trial is not right. Jesus does not minimise the law. He upholds the law. He doesn't minimise sin. He doesn't call it something else. He doesn't make excuses for the person in question. But this sinner cannot be condemned this day at this trial. Can she? And they all melt away. He honours the law. He can't be accused of dishonouring the law. And the woman goes free. He shows mercy. And he doesn't even have to accuse the accusers. They, they've accused themselves. He's just amazing. <laughs> Now, back in the ancient days, when people wore real watches, uh, in which things moved on the inside, uh, and you could buy ones like this that showed the workings of the watch, had a clear face, and showed the intricate workings of the timepiece. It was mesmerising to just look at it. I saw these and, uh, and to appreciate the beauty. And the ingenuity, the craftsmanship, the engineering is unbelievable. Just soak it in, how it operates. Forget about the time for a moment. You're not even looking at, at the hands. Just what goes on beneath, how it does its thing. It's good to just stand back and just see how Jesus operates. Just how he is at all times. How he works. So, Jesus is not saying that adultery or any sin, for that matter, does not matter. He's not saying that you can only judge a behaviour wrong if you've never ever done a single sin. In that case, you know, murderers would be loose on the street. And of course the account is not about whether capital punishment should ever take place in a society, all important things. It's not about that. But there are still practical applications in what we've seen so far and you can hardly read this account without certain things coming up in front of your face in the mirror that are worth thinking about. Of course the fact is that all of us hypocritically condemn people just a few weeks ago, I was driving somewhere and uh, one of my sons was in the passenger seat and the car at the, in front of us at the lights didn't notice that it was a green light. And so they were just sitting there. Um, and so I said, green light, you clown. Um, get moving, you know. I was like, some people, you know. Within about four minutes... At another set of lights, I'm enjoying my thoughts. I'm enjoying the scenery at the window of the car. When there was a voice in the passenger seat next to me. <clears throat> it's a green light, Dad. That's how it is. I always want grace to be applied to me. You know, I've done something wrong. I always want law to be applied to another if they've done something to me. What is wrong with me? There's a lot worth changing in us. See these things when we read an account like this. 
Let's get back to Jesus. We saw in him the character that enabled him to do something extraordinarily calm and clever in a terrifying moment. But what did he do? That's the important thing. The trap shows us how Jesus was. He shines in that moment, no doubt about it. But, what, but it also shows us what Jesus does. What did he do? What is he doing here? Well, of course, he's pardoning her from death. That's what he does. He's releasing someone to live. He's saving the condemned, saving sinners, but without making light of their sin. That's him. That's Jesus. That's so Jesus. We have that saying, at least I've heard it said, you know, oh, that's so someone, you know, that's so Fred, oh, that's so Mary, you know, oh, that's so Matthew, you know, what would they say about you? Right? Oh, that's so Matthew, <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, telling your family that you're on a health kick and, and you're off sugar, yeah. and then sneaking down to the pantry at night and Eating the lollies. <laughs> so Matthew, such a, <laughs> such a Matthew thing to do. Pardoning sinners. So Jesus. Always. And honouring the weight of sin and the law. But does he honour it? Really? Or did he just let it go? Of course he does. Because pardoning the guilty is not just what he does on this day in the temple courts. It's what he does, full stop. That's the bigger message and the massive irony. You had to notice it, didn't you? As we were reading. The irony at the heart of the gospel. She's guilty. They're guilty, and Jesus does not condemn. But who is the one person who isn't guilty? Him. Who is without sin? Jesus. He even said on one occasion, which of you accused me of sin? Even his enemies didn't speak up. So who has the right to throw the stone if a stone is going to be thrown? He does. But in the gospel, who will be condemned? He will. He will be surrounded, in fact, by an angry mob. He will be hounded. He will be executed. A price is paid. The price for all sin, the death of the Messiah. He honours the law and the full weight of it falls on him. So he is saying, I won't condemn you because I will be condemned for you. Friend, if you're, if you're at our church and you're not a Christian, but you at least want to know what the heart of it is that you've got to think about. This is the heart of it, and you have to see it. Most of us have no equivalent in our lives of being surrounded by a crowd of accusers. What a terrible thing it would be. But there is an equivalent in your spiritual life and in the spiritual life of every person. We all stand accused, but before the living God. And real guilt is ours. And there are witnesses to all you've done. Three witnesses to all you've done. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And they see all. And you probably can't appreciate just yet, if you're not, if you're not yet a Christian, or if you're not quite there, or if you're still a long way off, you probably can't appreciate 
just yet how shocking and adulterous it really is to deny the existence of God in your heart or to ignore God except when you need help. How dare we? Or to mock the God who has only ever given you life. But it is shocking and punishable. But you can be released because Christ was crushed for sins. Is anything stopping you from believing? I wonder. But when someone treats you with such love and grace, it can powerfully change you. Could this experience at the hands of the mercy of Jesus unlock for me the power to be moral and merciful somehow? A holy person, but not holier than thou toward other people in judgment. Not controlled by others in any way but still a servant to others. I think it can unlock the power to be all those things. That's the big change. Jesus says to the woman, I do not condemn you. But then what does he say? Now leave your life of sin. And don't reverse the order of what Jesus says. It's That's the key. First, you are not condemned. Can you receive that? You are not condemned. And with the power of that acceptance within you, you can, secondly, begin a holy life. Not live a holy life in order to then earn or merit that acceptance and that pardon note. Don't put it in the wrong order. First, grace, then change. Always. This is a shock to us because we're so used to trying to do what's right because of what comes after that decision. We do what's right because after that decision we'll get some recognition from other people as a good person. Or if we do what's right we know we'll avoid the punishment that would have otherwise come to us. In other words we're driven by our pride or our fear again. But gospel power is that I change because of what comes before the change. There is already acceptance, pardon, grace, and love. I do what is right from a heart that's been ridiculously loved, not out of fear or pride and not because of what comes next. And that is a completely different way to live. Christian stories introduce this powerful thing, this grace thing, into the stories we tell, which had never quite been there before until Jesus. Grace first. Here's an example. In Les Miserables, the great book, you might have seen the musical or seen the film, uh, Jean Valjean has been released from prison. He, he's been uh, a criminal man. And he gets taken in at a point in his life by a kind bishop, a kind bishop, a true priest. Uh, who feeds him and cares for him, doesn't judge him because of his past. And then Jean Valjean leaves and he steals the bishop's silverware and he takes off. You might remember this story. Some thanks. But he's caught. And the police, knowing or recognising the items that he's stolen, they bring him back to the bishop's house. 
having arrested him to confirm what has happened. But the bishop comes to the door and he says, it's okay, officer. He, he did not steal from me. In fact, Valjean, you left behind the silver candlesticks that I was planning to give you as well. Take them. They're yours. Valjean goes free. And then he is struck in his heart. And he considers the price the bishop paid to have purchased his soul. And under the power of the mercy, the inexplicable, nonsensical mercy he has experienced, his life is changed into one of gracious love. Not from fear or reward, but by love and grace. True change. And the story can be ours. To be good from fear or pride, that is not living. No, we have a heart melted and remolded into a happy, humble heart by the fire of Jesus' grace. A heart that doesn't turn away from what's wrong by mere obedience, but because that heart has been given mercy and can't help but change. And don't worry, the fire does sting. The bishop's love stung Valjean with shame for a moment. And when the Pharisees felt it standing in front of Jesus just for a moment, they walked away from Jesus. But the woman stayed long enough. She stayed long enough to know that Jesus knew her life of sin, of pain. But also long enough to know the cool relief of hearing, I set you free. And that is the Christian experience. God's mercy rips your heart open but transforms it from the inside out. I have committed sin and his acceptance to me is all gift, so I must not be proud. But I am totally accepted and his payment is enough, so I must never be afraid. This week in your life, I hope you know that because of God's grace, you have the power to hand whatever shame you have over to the Lord Jesus. And I wouldn't hand it over to anyone but him. But you have the power to hand it over to him. If that shame involves a sexual history you're ashamed of, you can release that burden too. Whatever you've done, it is not the end of the world. It never is with Jesus. Never. This week in your life, it might be there's judgment in your own heart towards someone that you are now ready to release. You've been thinking, yeah, I, I wish I could drag them before a crowd because of what they did and said. You can drop the stone you hold toward them and be free of that hatred too. Surely you can. And this week in your life, I don't know how you should decide when to apply justice and mercy. I don't know. That never gets easy, but I know you don't have to feel trapped because God will apply justice and mercy perfectly at the end of the age, even when we fail to get it right. And I also know that you are going to be much closer to getting it right, getting the decision right, because you as a graced person, 
as a forgiven sinner. You do not make decisions based on your pride or fear or panic. And you move out into life from a position of courage and deep humility and empathy for the failure of others, being a failure yourself, and deep love for holiness and justice and goodness, all because of God's love for you. It's how Jesus is. It's what he's done for us. It's what changes us. Sounds good, I think. Sounds like life. Let me pray. Our Father, we thank you for Jesus, for his splendid wisdom, his peerless, calm, poise, confidence. Oh, he knew who he was. Beloved of the Father. He knew his mission was to come and to give. Couldn't be made to be afraid. Couldn't be controlled by others. Let us see the Master and walk in the way of the Master. And we thank you for the mercy that you offer to us in the gospel. It's not found anywhere else. No other system. No other revelation. No other prophet or guru or teacher can offer the mercy of Jesus, the one who himself took the weight of the law. Please let us know that we can be set free and to live in that freedom for a change of life that is not like anything else in the world either that does not come out of fear or pride, that does not come because of what comes next, but comes solely out of the heart of what has gone before, your inexplicable and overwhelming love known to us because you have made it clear and we've felt it deep within. Change us into people like that here in this place, this church, in our own lives and families, we pray. How good it will be. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to sing again, and uh, we won't see the kids just yet. We're going to sing another song that I pray will be relevant to what we've been thinking about. We worship the, the name of the Lord because...